So Nate, congratulations on the superior show. The Thank faculty you. are very proud of you. Thank you. And your exhibition, which I think is exemplary. Mm -hmm. So would you just take us through a kind of visual tour? Like, what are the key elements of this exhibition? What would you want somebody to pay attention to if they were walking into the gallery? So the first thing that I would want them to pay attention to is obviously the blue line, um, because that's the, the, the piece that's going to lead you throughout the whole gallery, and it's going to take you almost on a tour throughout the whole space. Um, and also because that's the, the reference to the trip, which the show is all about, the service trip to California. And it also references the trip for the boxes, which is the product that's being shipped from Michigan to California. So the blue line is extremely important because it's taking the viewer on a tour of this gallery, but also on a tour of um, the journey of the boxes, which is the product and the concentration of the show. Mm -hmm. So I noticed there's a table in the middle of the exhibition, the line sort of surrounds it. Mm -hmm. It seems to be the focal point of the show beyond the blue line. Do you want to just talk a little bit about what is on that table? So on the table is um, a series of prints that I did, uh, screen prints, um, in an envelope, um, just a couple of the illustrations that I have for a children's book, a Coptic stitch journal um, wrapped in marbled paper, um, and a number of shadow boxes. So there's 25 of each of these items um, and they're all going to be put into, placed into a box which will be shipped. So they're in the middle of the room just to show that that, that is the emphasis of the show, um, the actual product in the finalized box which will be shipped to California. So each um, teen from the club will be receiving one of these boxes which each, with each of those components inside of them. What is your hope for when they receive a box what is your hope that their response might be? Even though you have no control over that, I'm just sort of curious what your, your aspirations, your, if it had worked out perfectly, what would that reaction be? I, for me, I, I think the best thing that I would want to see come from these boxes when they are given to um, the individuals is that they see them as a safe space for themselves and as a place that they can make their own and that they can define by what they put into it and the energy and the time that they spend with this product so that it becomes something special, not because I made it or because I gave it to them, but because they put their own personal time and energy into it and that their gifts and that their inner self is being um, exemplified by what they put into it and it becomes their own. So I think that I'd like to see um, the boxes become very personable to each individual, mm -hmm. so that say I ever see these people or um, visit with them, that they could maybe come up to me with these boxes and say, look at what this has become. Mm -hmm. So to see that the evolution of the box by what they are contributing to it. So it has a lot of potential built yeah. into it. Yep. The, the blank book, for example, is, yep. has a lot of potential. Yep. So how does that fit in with the mission of the club that these kids belong to in Los Angeles? So the after school program, El Santo Nino, which is located in East LA, is a, it's a Catholic charity um, and all of the students come there on a daily basis and it's really a, it's a home to them. I, uh, when I visited, I referred to it and I shared a lot of my story about it was similar to the ski resort that I grew up at because it, I was there every single day. Mm -hmm. So the people that I was with every single day they knew what I was doing in school. It was almost like a family, you know. Mm -hmm. You'd sit down, you'd have dinner together, but instead of dinner, you're playing kickball. So there's many ways that it becomes your home, and the students and the kids attending to this club, um, they rely on each other and they understand community because it's a space that no one person owns. Um, it's a communal space that they all have to respect, and um, there's definitely no entitlement to any of the the things there, but it's a shared space. What does the title of the show mean? It's diakonia, doc, yeah, diakonia. The that's a word, word I don't know. So why yeah. don't you tell me about that? Um, so diakonia is a Greek word, um, and it is, it's meaning to serve or to set a table. So it's referencing service or the service of another. Um, this word was brought up in conversation when I was um, talking with Father John, and he actually used it as um, for one of our, scholar, our, our campus ministry scholars uh, meetings mm -hmm. and he was sharing with us that this was a word used in the Catholic Church um, to reference someone's service 
And so I thought it was appropriate for this show because this is what my service is, or I'm using my personal gifts to serve others. And it's really um, kind of demonstrating the idea of to do something for others, just not because out of obligation, but because it's what you do. And we take care of each other. Awesome. So you actually had a different title for the show not too long ago. Do yep. you want to talk about that as well? So originally my show title was going to be Connectedness because that's one of my strengths as a person um, based off of the Gallup's um, Strength Finder. So Connectedness <laughs> is the ability to... Is this an online tool you yeah. use to, <laughs> yeah. to discover your strengths and weaknesses? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's um, the ability to kind of see everything in connection and um, how everything is correlated or uh, relies on each other and how one thing can affect another. And so I was wanted to call it connectedness because I wanted to sh demonstrate what I've learned over the four years while being at Seattle Heights mm -hmm. University, and to connect those and make one cohesive show that can demonstrate that. And so I was going to take all the pieces that I had um, experienced and all the things I've learned and put them into one. And I think that that still happened in the show. It's just the title became more specific and. Mm -hmm. There was a more, more mysterious. Yeah, there was a there was well, there was a more concentration to the show, and it it was became related to something specific versus just being something broad and undefined. Uh huh. So it became it became something that people can recognize and remember as a certain thing. I think more than anybody I know on the campus today that you are connected through mm -hmm. lots of different ways. Um, your, the reception you had here with the, uh, the oral defense, mm -hmm. so many people from lots of different yeah. places. Do you want to talk about the, the, the different kinds of groups that you see yourself connected to yeah. here on campus? I, I'm definitely a part of a number of groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, being involved with Residence Life, Campus Ministry, um, Art Department, which is its own uh, family itself, and then also being involved in all of the offices by just stopping in and grabbing coffee or talking to the people in the office. Um, that pumps you up, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. You're so an to, extrovert. You really like yeah, that. I like to be with uh, different people and around different people and under, have feedback about what I'm doing and understand what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and just to make sure that I am connected and that everyone feels connected through me. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing, they're actually a part of. Um, seems to me that might be your real service here on campus, yeah. that you're doing a service for the kids in East LA, but you're also providing a service and connecting people here on campus, making the, that sense of community really strong. Yeah, I think that that is one of my natural gifts is to bring people together. And I think that um, creating experiences is what I really like to do. Uh, you know, so often we want a product, but I right. think an experience as a product is so amazing because we buy products and then yeah. we use them and throw them away. Yeah, mm -hmm. or you buy a product to create an experience. Yeah. So what can we do that's more of a creating a communal experience that everyone can be a part of and share mm -hmm. and use it to motivate them or to move them into creating their own experiences for other people. Right. Which creates a pro product, which creates community, which unfolds into a number of ways. And yeah, so you see this as like dominoes falling yeah. that you create one thing yeah. that creates another. Effect. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the process of your show? Because you put in countless hours to create this, and when you look at it on the face of things, it's pretty simple. You've designed it in a way that's very reductive, and you've just simplified everything. Yeah. But the number of hours that go into this, what, what would you say is the value in doing that process? And you want to just maybe choose one of them for us and talk about how you went about from the beginning to the end of creating a component? Yeah. So I'll, I'll speak about the, the main concentration of the show, which is the boxes. Um, the boxes as the process, um, those, the process. The container that these things yeah. are going in. Okay. So what all the product is going in and being shipped in. Um, so the boxes are built with pallet wood on the top and then they Where'd have. Where'd you find the pallet wood? So the pallets are from on campus, um, being friends with the maintenance uh, <laughs> guys. I was able to use the pallets and I had to strip them down. I had to cut them to two and a half by 12 inches. So there was a there was a real repetitive nature to all of this process, especially after uh, the rip down of the pallets, the screen printing on the outside of the boxes, which was the same for each box. So is this repetitive process again for the 25 boxes? So 
after they were screen printed, um, then they were assembled. So each, each step was just 25, 25, 25. So all of my show was very repetitive because of the 25, the number. Mm -hmm. And so the process became very meditative. Mm -hmm. And it also became something that I could escape from other things by doing that. Um, and, but it also became a challenge to you know, create a product that was consistent because a, a lot of these processes, um, there's a lot of alteration throughout them, such as screen printing, you know, you pull differently, you're gonna have a different result. So trying to make it consistent, but also allowing those um, alterations to happen because that's creating this unique box or this unique product, which is also referencing the uniqueness of a person. It's receiving the box. So mm -hmm. the process definitely... So you think of each container as being sort of a metaphor for a person? Yeah. Okay. I think it represents um, us as individuals and um, the boxes themselves have so many... Um, can relate to us in so many ways. If you look at the screen prints on the side, which is a four color separation. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea of colors overlapping in certain ways to create new hues. Um, and when you look at it, you can see a new depth. Um, so it's almost like the idea of viewing something and being able to put two things together to mm -hmm. create something new that mm -hmm. didn't exist. Um, and I think that's the idea of creating any experience in the world is two Do people come together. Do I remember right that these boxes were built once and then you tore them apart and rebuilt them? Yeah. So the boxes were originally built with just one um, two by twelve are uh, two by four as the height. Uh -huh. And then after I built one, it looked really squished with the color. So I wanted to add another um, height. So the depth of the box was increased. Mm -hmm. And so the boxes grew. So I took them all apart, screen printed again, and then assembled them all. So they did grow as the process, which was very much a part of the was show. It, was it worth putting in that extra effort? I Yeah, I would have been crazy gone crazy <laughs> if I wouldn't have done that because I wouldn't have been happy with them because I would have known that I could have done that. Was it a design decision or was it really a practical thing that you had too much stuff to fit in the box? It was a little it was a little bit of both. I think that if I wouldn't have added that extra height to the box that the things putting that I'm putting in the box the products would have been squished mm -hmm. and also if you think about um, you want to be able to these boxes you want the individuals to be able to add certain things to them. So okay. there's not going to be enough so space. So it's not just a box for delivering, it's a box for them to keep things in. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So it was definitely, I think it was aesthetic, but it was also practical to add that extra the space for the individual. Do you want to talk about the, the, the experience of actually putting the show together? You had a couple of days between mm -hmm. the previous show and when your show opened. And I remember coming in here maybe for 10 minutes, and the numbers of people that were in here yeah. was remarkable. You had a lot of collaborators. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, I had an idea of what your show was going to look like, and it didn't end up physically looking like your original plan. Do you want to talk about that process of getting people involved and the process of making last-minute aesthetic decisions about yes. changing things? So a week before my show, I wanted to redo everything mm -hmm. because I just was sick of looking at it or I was only seeing what, was, what I thought was wrong with it because I've been staring at it for so long. But once I brought it into this space and I had friends and um, family supporting me and being in here and helping me out, it definitely became something different, um, especially... An event, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... Having, I definitely could not have done any of this or been able to paint this massive blue line and um, been able to achieve the setup and hang, the hanging of the large luggage tag without the help of many people. I mean, I would be painting the outside of the line, someone would be filling it, um, someone would be doing touch up, someone would be concentrating on the registers, getting the blue paint right in there. So it was definitely something that was communal and I mm -hmm. think that was really cool. Um, it was hard at times because, you know, I had done all the work mostly by myself up until this point and then to actually create a space and create something for the public to walk into, I needed the help of a lot of people so I had to put my trust in others and I also had to let go of my pride to say, all right, 
help me out. You I can't need, control everything. I can't do it all myself. What was important to control, though? Because I know that the... Like, you were going to have shelves and other yep. things on the walls, and you ended up pulling all that out of your finished design. Why? Yep. Um, the aesthetic of the, the space, the ex creating this experience in here, and um, really looking at the space as a whole uh, unit. So you're looking at, you could imagine as a piece of white paper, you have to think about balance, you have to think about unity, you have to think about the elements and principles of design that mm -hmm. we learn. So you have to look at it as a single product right you know it's it's one itself it's a whole thing so the whole unity of the whole show it's, yeah so you have that's to really, what you controlled while other people yeah were so it. there was decisions that i wouldn't have been able to change if i didn't have people who could take down the shelves mm -hmm. put the shelves up then take them down because <laughs> if i would have done that myself it would have taken me an hour mm -hmm. but because i had so many friends helping me out you know, boom, I could make a decision or a change or an alteration so mm -hmm. quickly because they were there to help. So you looked at variations and then made quick decisions yes. about what to do and not to do. So having people here allowed me to really play with certain things, change things, and set it up so I felt that it created a good experience. So I think maybe a, the average art person coming into the gallery, maybe somebody who's not an art major, would look at your pile of boxes and think that's just a pile of boxes. But I'm wondering if you think that's a sculpture. I, I see it as a sculpture as well because I see that whole back nook as really a cohesive piece and I see it as, um, I see it as lending itself as one unit. You know, the boxes being together become one thing and they are an installation and it's leading the eye up into the tag which leads you out of that nook. So together, the boxes are creating um, a path for your eyes and a path for the viewer. So they are really, they're needed um, and they rely on each other to, you know, with, like the blue line, lead the viewer through the space. Had you thought about other arrangements of the boxes, like stacking 25 yeah. high? Or, you know, why, yeah, so originally I wanted to have everything set up on the walls, 25 boxes stacked, mm -hmm. 25 books stacked, 25 of the print stacked. Mm -hmm. So I wanted everything very, like you're in a store, you know, you're reaching on the shelf. So, and that was my way of referencing mass production. Yeah. Um, and once and I got it. Consumerism. Yeah, and consumerism, the idea of just grabbing yeah. something and, you know, you see it as all the same. But I think the fact that they're installed this way is also referencing their uniqueness, as I said before. The fact that they're set up in such a unique way is it's lending itself to their uniqueness. So if they would have been set up on a shelf, you would have seen them more as all the same or just as one of 25. Do you, do you imagine that maybe those boxes, once they're filled and you get them out to Los Angeles, might be another installation out there that has a different arrangement? Yeah, and I don't know, maybe they take them home, maybe they leave them at the after-school program. Um, I'm not really sure, but I think... I was just thinking maybe some anticipation where you say yeah. there's something inside for you, but you don't get to look. Yeah. Because right now it's a sculpture. Yeah. But in a week... Yeah. They're going to be opened up. They're yeah. going to become something like totally East, different. Like an Easter basket or Christmas. Yeah. You know, yeah. You that anticipation. Yeah, and that was what was funny, that my show took place during Holy Week and yeah. during Easter. So what else did you want people to know about the show that you think in the last couple of minutes you'd want to add that we haven't talked about? I think the biggest thing is um, to recognize opportunity. So I had an, a privileged opportunity of being given a large space mm -hmm. and the opportunity to publicly say something or to put my energy into something. So I think I would like people to take from the show is the, um, the privilege of having an opportunity and to really take initiative to take over that opportunity and to create it, make it your own and to turn it into something that has fruit which lends itself in the future. So it doesn't just once I take this show down, it ends, but right. it has a life after mm -hmm. this exhibition. And I think that to have that privilege is really important and you need to recognize that because not many people get that opportunity and I think a lot of people wish they had that opportunity. Yeah, So sure. to recognize where you're It requires a lot of hard work. Yeah. yeah, and to also do things that are helping other people. Awesome, well, yeah. thanks for talking about your show. Thank you, appreciate it. Cut, that was long. <laughs> Is that what you're expecting? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of questions perfect. on the list. That was perfect.